please don't patronize me by telling me that the oil and gas industry doesn't have any special tax provisions. Because if you would like that to be the rule, I would be happy to have Congress deliver. They're estimated to be between 60 to 90% of the cost of drilling. How much of those intangible drilling costs do you get to deduct right away from your taxes? Um, we get to deduct all of those just like any other business. Uh, we do not. How much do you get there, to there, deduct? There seems to be a misconception out there that you're operating from that somehow the oil and gas industry uh, benefits from some special sort of tax uh, structure. We don't. We actually. We actually. We're uh, claiming my time, Mr. Murphy. Industry oh, um, I will follow up with you, Mr. Murphy, but. You do benefit from special rules. There's a special tax rule for intangible drilling costs that does not apply to other kinds of expenses that businesses have. You get to deduct 70% of your costs immediately and other businesses have to amortize their expenses over their entire profit stream. We, we also so have- So please don't, please don't patronize me by telling me that the oil and gas industry doesn't have any special tax provisions. Because if you would like that to be the rule, I would be happy to have Congress deliver. I yield back. Uh, John, how much do you love watching Katie Porter grill people like this? Yeah, it was it was pretty good. It was the the threat at the end, especially. It was clever. It was delivered forcefully. I did like it. It it has a very like like you've been trying to get one over on the teacher vibe. That entire interaction and her response <laughs> yes. played into that as well in in the best possible way. Uh, like I I guess he just didn't know. I guess he didn't know that they had these special tax breaks. Like How imagine. Could he? Who do you think you're talking? You think you're talking to like Marjorie Taylor Greene, like that she's not going to have done the research? Yeah, I think Katie Porter is going to have a good idea of what you're going to be talking about at the hearing. Wait, private companies spend 17 times more on administrative costs than Medicare. What are private insurance companies spending on that Medicare is not? Does Medicare spend hundreds of millions of dollars on television advertisements like private insurance does? Dr. Collins. Here's the moment Representative Katie Porter absolutely crushed private health insurance companies for their added fees and costs. I love it. Keep watching. Uh, no. Does Medicare spend millions of dollars on stock buybacks to shareholders? No. Does Medicare um, spend money on marketing? Private insurance likes to put its name on stadiums and PGA tournaments. Is there a Medicare arena? No. Does Medicare spend $23 million on executive pay like private insurance companies do? No. There isn't a lot of good news, but anytime Katie Porter gets to grill anyone on anything, it's typically exciting because she comes with the facts, she comes with the receipts. And in this context, she's specifically carrying out what we need to hear in Congress in regard to Medicare for all and how it would actually save not only Americans, but the US government quite a bit of money. It would be a far better system than the system that we currently have that relies mostly on private health insurance companies. Ms. Swear, in 2019, you testified on Representative Cicilline's bill, the assault weapons ban before Congress. At the 2019 hearing, Representative Jim Jordan asked you if law-abiding people will be less safe to protect themselves if that bill was passed. Do you remember your response? I have a general idea of what I would have said under that circumstance, but no, I don't remember my specific words. You said, and I quote, I think worse than that, sir, you will see millions of otherwise law-abiding citizens become felons overnight. Yes. For nothing more than having scary looking features on firearms. It's I was true. quite surprised by your answer. You read the bill before you came to Congress to testify against it, yes? Uh, if we're referring to the ban on assault weapons? Correct. correct. Yes. So you knew that the bill would allow any gun owner to maintain possession of any semi-automatic assault weapon that was lawfully possessed before the bill became law. No, uh, so that is the case under that bill. The problem is any time that time. is transferred to anybody else, my time. that Madam now Chair, becomes an issue. Would you please instruct the witness that the time belongs to me? The debate in the end though is very simple, so let's break it down. What she said, what was quoted directly there by Katie Porter was that 
simply because the guns look scary or whatever. And in her extended testimony, which I watched, she kept going to like, this is just about people who don't understand what a pistol grip is or a barrel shroud or whatever, which is of course not at the core of concerns about assault weapons, that they will become felons because their guns have those things. And that is simply not true. In the bill, as she admits, you do not become a felon because you own a gun that was legal when you purchased it. The bill 100% makes allowances for that. You can keep the gun that you have. She understands that. The issue is that she wasn't brought there by the Heritage Foundation either now or in past years to accurately describe or analyze the Constitution or pieces of legislation. She's there to terrify gun owners and to try to derail gun reform. And so she got really snippy when Katie Porter pointed that out very succinctly.